Um, many thanks to colleagues for joining the CARVIS and colleagues for our debate today, the power of pubs, protecting social infrastructure and laying the groundwork for levelling up. I'm Jonathan Warren. I'm the chief executive of the CARVIS, the independent place-focused think tank. And the background to our debate today is this. Last month, we published our report, The Power of Pubs. Now this month, well, as of last Monday, I'm sure many of us have trooped dutifully to our local, where it's got an outside area or beer garden to gargle a well-deserved pint. But importantly, the future of our pubs is precarious. So the question we're seeking to answer from our report is how do we shore up the pub as a crucial cornerstone of community and local economic life in the medium to long term? Now, the dry economic stats are this. Pubs support 884,860 jobs across the UK, pumping in £12 billion worth of wages and 23.4 billion of GVA across the country. It's a key part of our foundational economy in our towns and cities everywhere. But our debate here is about more than regurgitating dry economic statistics. In life, it's the heart that's important, is it not? And one of my friends who works in the pub trade told me at the outset when Lucarli started this project, he said, where there's a pub, there's a community. Now pubs form a vital part of our social infrastructure in place. They're the anchors that tie the community together, particularly in rural towns and villages. So to expand today on the findings of our report, The Power of Pubs, we want to ask, what is the role of our pubs in the levelling up process? Secondly, how should government plans for growth, skills and regeneration support a crucial and rather robust labour market that covers a very young and diverse employee base? And finally, how could the industry best work with councils and communities to ensure the pub is the hub for a wide range of social purposes, especially those that support cohesion and inclusion? Now, the Carlis is blessed with a spectacularly strong lineup of speakers to debate the policy, the business, and the politics of pubs and their community, social, and economic role. Who do we have? We've got Ed Beddington, editor at Pub Trade Bible, the Morning Advertiser. Great pleasure to have Danny Kruger, MP for Devices, author of Leveling Up Communities, and for those that have seen it, today's um, Times Redbox piece about this event. Great pleasure to introduce Emma McClarkin, Chief Executive of the British Beer and Pub Association. And finally, with great pleasure, I'm great from the car list to invite Paul Scully, Minister for Small Business, Consumers and Labour Markets, as well as Minister for London at the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, while it still has industrial strategy in the title. So we're going to keep this very simple and straightforward. We've got until 11.45. In terms of the orders of today, I'm going to invite each of our speakers in alphabetical order to briefly set out what they think is most important um, in the, in the, in the, for the future of our pubs. We will then debate amongst ourselves. Please lob in uh, your questions in the Q&A box as provided. As with all our events, there are always more questions than answers, but we will endeavour to make sure that we find answers to your questions. For those following on Twitter today, we have a hashtag, it's in the Q&A box, hashtag the power of pubs. So we've got a, another 40 minutes with this spectacular lineup of speakers to debate how we secure the medium to long-term future of our pubs. And without any further ado, Ed, can I invite you to unmute and tell us your opinions, please. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, I think, I mean, you, you said yourself that um, where there's a pub, there's a community. I think the reality is that quite often the pub is the heart of that community. Um, I would, there's, there's a simple thing that I would point to to demonstrate, you know, how important pubs are. They're, they are part of our cultural heritage, you know, we are unique in the world for having this um, uh, this uh, concept of, of a pub uh, in, the, in the way it is. But I think you only have to look at the start of the of this crisis uh, and the start of the lockdown and the things that pubs did for their local communities 
during that, uh, very much putting uh, putting themselves sort of at the back of the queue, looking after people, you know, cooking meals for homeless people, cooking meals for elderly and vulnerable people that, that couldn't get out and, and were, were left alone, uh, setting up as uh, local shops to provide the products that were running out on the supermarket shelves and ensuring that people were getting things like bread, eggs, milk, things like that. Um, that in itself for me really demonstrated, and it was something we, we celebrated with the Great British Pub Awards, um, but that very much demonstrated, you know, how important pubs are, um, regardless of everything else that goes on around them, they are very much those, those intrinsic parts of the communities that they sit in, um, and long may that continue, whether that's from, you know, providing, you know, uh, a place for the lonely, through to, you know, first jobs for people within those communities as they start their, their road to, to adulthood. Um, there are so many benefits to pubs, I could talk for hours, but uh, you told me to keep it brief, so I'll, I'll park that one there. Many thanks, Ed, for getting us off to a start. Can I next invite Danny Kruger MP to share his views? Uh, thanks, Jonathan. Um, very good to be with you all. Um, I mean, I'll, 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 no, no doubt Paul will talk a bit about what the government has been doing and will be doing on uh, support for the pub business. I mean, I, I, you know, as a local MP, I've had a huge amount of correspondence from landlords um, you know, in, in serious distress through this crisis. And, um, uh, you know, I do need to always point out to them that probably of all the sectors in the economy, the hospitality business has had the most direct support from government. Uh, you know, from obviously furlough schemes, but restart grants, business rate holidays, VAT reduction, eat out to help out, the loan scheme, council grants, all of these have been available. Um, and yet none of this, of course, is, makes up for the loss of commercial revenue. And this sector has got the most support because it's been the most hard hit. And we have a virus which targets conviviality. It works through social networks. And as we've been hearing, and I couldn't agree more, pubs are the heart of our community. So they are the, the breeding grounds, the, the transmission areas for, for this virus. So. Uh, you know, it's absolutely appalling what the pandemic has done to pubs and really, really pleased that they're now getting open again and uh, very much support everything that the government's doing to help. Um, I mean, you know, obviously we know it's the, it's the uncertainty that the, the, the pandemic has induced that's been the most painful thing for pubs. They can't plan effectively. And what we really need to ensure is that, you know, we really do open up again on the 21st of June and that is permanent and that we don't go back because that's, that's what's going to kill these pubs. They, they're struggling through, but they'll make it, I'm confident, if, if, if we stay open after the 21st of June, um, which is why the cautious emergence from lockdown is, is, is right, even though it's obviously very painful to go so slowly. Um, more generally, I think a really positive shift is underway in our society and our economy uh, towards a more community-focused vision of how we want to live. And that's what the you know, the legacy of this terrible pandemic should be a more local, more sustainable life for us all. And I think the pub is essential to that. It's interesting this story this week about what football clubs and the government that institutions are not purely commercial, even if they have a commercial framework, um, and, and that we need gathering places and institutions of, of belonging, uh, which are the foundation of our society and of our economy. So I, I, I support all of these steps that, that are underway. And I, I'm a supporter of a local pub in my constituency called the Silks on the Downs, which has been, the, the landlord is selling to, to the community and they are raising money. I'm now a proud shareholder of this pub. And I think these models and the government set up a community ownership fund to support projects like that, uh, initiatives like that. So the more focus we can have on the role of pubs in our communities, and this is where commerce meets community, is really important. I hope we can see reductions in beer duty. I hope we can extend these rates, holidays, and so on, and support all of that. Paul might be able to give an indication of that. Um, but fundamentally, it's about all of us supporting our local pub, which let's all do that enthusiastically this summer. Thanks. Many thanks indeed, um, Danny. And I'm now going to ask Emma McClarkin to, um, from the BPPA to give your views, please. Fire away. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us this morning to talk about my favourite topic, which is the Great British Pub. It has been a devastating time for the beer and the pub sector. Let's not forget our brewers, their taps were turned off at the same time as well. Um, but we now are entering a period of beginning 
uh, the end of these restrictions and the beginning of a very long road to recovery. And there are many things that are outlined within the context of the report that Lukas produced produced on the power of the pub, what we can do uh, and what the government can do to support that recovery uh, as we move through these phases, but it outlines very, very succinctly just how and why um, the power of the pub should be used and invested in, um, because the difference it makes economically, 23 billion that we contribute uh, to the economy, but more than that, just what we do from that social value aspect, you know, everyone's mentioned that we're the heart of the community. What we are doing for high street regeneration is phenomenal as we breathe back new life into those um, sleepy town centres uh, and even our city centres. You know, what hospitality and the pub sector can do to really kickstart the economy there, breathe new regeneration and renewal of those uh, communities and high streets is phenomenal. But if we have the backing and the bandwidth to do that, and I think it's really important that we look at the sector. It was doing well, but still struggling, I have to say, under a significant burden going into this pandemic. Um, and we certainly need to address and support us as we enter into our recovery. But for the longer term, we do need to see more support for our pubs. In 2020, we know that we lost 2,000 pubs. That was five pubs closing their doors every single day. We don't want to be in the same situation at the end of 2021, so we have to find a way forward. What can we do? Well, the report highlights, um, as we also support at the BBPA, we really need the government to stick to the removal of restrictions and its own roadmap that by the 21st of June, we can get back to trading viably. Why can't we trade viably before? Because our capacity is massively restricted. And so we desperately need the government to stick to its roadmap and that removal. But we need to look at that tax burden that businesses were under before, looking at finding a new reform for business rates in a fair way of doing that for our pubs, but also looking at extending the current discount that we have on VAT and making that a permanent one. That would really help the sustainable recovery of the pub sector that employs 43% of our young people, that is very often the first job that people have and can very often be the place where it's the only conversation that people have and human interaction in their community during the day. So um, there are so many reasons why we should support the pub, but if we fail to do so, uh, those pubs will close their doors, we will face some social isolation um, and we will absolutely suffer, not only economically, but socially from it and be poorer for it. So let's all do what we can to really harness the power of the pub uh, as we move through this pandemic and into recovery. Many thanks to Emma McClark and Chief Executive at the British Beer and Pub Association. Um, and our final speaker, great pleasure to introduce um, Minister for Small Business, Paul Scully. We've done this alphabetically, so no cheating minister, but I think we've possibly saved the best till last. So please, very grateful to hear you, your views about how we shore up our pubs in the medium to long term. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Jonathan. And no, the, you've had some excellent speakers, so it's uh, a lot to to, to uh, follow them because uh, you know we all enjoy our own pubs our, our, and uh, that we see in our community. And together, as Emma said, they make such a contribution to to the UK as a whole, to our economy, uh, but also to our society and communities. And uh, you know, Emma was right to highlight the fact that in the lead up to COVID, for, for years, um, the politicians have been uh, queuing up to support, rightly support their pubs in the face of a number of pubs uh, closing down uh, uh, over a period of time. And it's one of those areas that when you're in some of these, uh, especially rural areas, but not solely rural, rural areas, when they close, often they are lost forever. And so it's, it's a bit of our history, it's a bit of our community that can be lost forever. So what can we do to protect that? First of all, we've got to get this through 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 this pandemic, uh, as you've heard. Uh, one of the things we are working to is to make sure that the opening is one way. One of the big learning uh, pieces for me uh, in over the last few months is that stop start uh, uh, that we had in with the tiered systems and the lead up to Christmas was was devastating for pubs in terms of the supplies that had to throw away, food and of course beer. And then the reopening, you can't just suddenly magic up beer that does take time to brew. Um, and I'm really, really aware that the pubs will not be returning to anywhere near profit 
until after the 21st of June. At, mo at the moment, it's very much about minimizing losses. It's great to see people um, back in uh, pubs and bars and restaurants over the last week, uh, but, but still this is stemming those losses. So it's really important that we do drive towards that 21st of June, which we're only gonna be able to do through Follow the rules, the hand space space and fresh air. It's that fresh air that uh, is why we've taken the step to reopen pubs uh, outdoors, first of all, before hopefully drive, continue to drive transmissions down so we can start to open indoors and then uh, open up the, uh, uh, the, 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 get rid of the social distance uh, measures uh, pretty well all, all after the 21st of June, as long as we follow that path. But you asked about levelling up as well how can we level up now clearly pubs in the hospitality sector agenda uh, uh, uh the sector generally rather as as is absolutely a massive role to play in this so beyond reopening beyond the recovery the initial recovery we want to make sure that the hospitality sector is as resilient as possible we've been talking to emma and, uh, and other people within the sector uh, about what we, what we can do with skills and encourage more people into the, to, into hospitality uh, and this is right way right the way uh, across the country in every region in every developed nation and clearly hospitality has a low bar of entry into to, to come into it and that's why uh, you get a number of students in there it's 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 a great place to actually take up some of the uh uh, the, 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 the structural unemployment that you, that you might find following a recession, uh, following a, this sort of pandemic. But what we've got to make sure that we've got the skills uh, and the work are, are around with hospitality to make sure there's a great career progression right the way through uh, in terms of hospitality management. I know a number of uh, uh, restaurants and pubs and bars do, do work around, around uh, qualifications that they can then take to, to other organisations. So it's really important that we, uh, that we work on skills. The, Danny and Ed talked about the community ownership fund as well and the, the, the fact that we, we need to make sure that we can help communities um, actually buy up and, 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 and make the most of those um, institutions and venues that the local facilities that benefit their communities. And to one of the questions in, 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 the, uh, in, the, in the chat, it's really important that we do make that available to every community, not just wealthier communities. So there's a matched funding uh, the community groups can bid up to uh, for up to £250,000 worth of fund to help buy local assets. And I've got a really good example in my borough, in the borough of Sutton. The Hope Pub in uh, in Sutton was a, a an, a an area where a pub where for years, for decades, it was um, known as a bit of a problem pub. Uh, and it went through managers, etc. And then the community, actually before this, this fund clearly, bought it up. Uh, and now it's run by a real enthusiastic guy called uh, Roger Monu, who subsequently has taken up other uh, other other pubs and, and, and venues, including the local theatre, and runs the catering there. And it wins the Camera Award pretty well in, around London pretty well every year for the last five or six years. Uh, and it's a phenomenal achievement, shows what can be done by the power of community. But as we've heard, pubs go both ways. They serve that community. They, they, they contribute not just for a nice day out, not just for our well-being, but the direct uh, work that you've seen from pubs uh, in terms of feeding, uh, uh, providing meals, providing support for the most vulnerable in their, in, in, in their communities. And that can be really especially uh, true of, of rural areas. So I am, as everybody's, like everybody, a big fan of the British pub. It's an institution that has to remain, but we cannot um, just assume that it's going to remain, that it's going to come out of this pandemic that, um, and, and just everything will be, be back to 2019. So that comes to what Danny was talking about in terms of business rates. We've got the funda fundamental business rate review, which will report back in October, which I, you know, I hope we'll have that sort of more holistic view about bricks and mortar businesses. Uh, we clearly um, continue to work with the, uh, the pub code as well to try and get a really difficult balance for, for tied pubs as well. But, the, but with, with all of our support, the future of the British pub can be very bright again. Many thanks indeed, Minister Scully, and many thanks indeed to all our panellists for getting us off to such a strong start. Um, so we've got you know, various questions coming in through the Q&A. I will do my best to, to, re to relay them and to, to generate the debate from there. Um, before we do so, quick sort of, um, question to 
primarily firstly to Ed and Emma about the, the changing nature of pubs. Uh, pubs have always, always had to adapt to all sorts of circumstances throughout history. And the, the general rule of thumb has been you no know, good pubs will emerge where no, where no not so good pubs have, have, have not thrived. How do you, in, in short terms, from what you're hearing from members and hearing from the pub trade, how do you think that the, the pub sector is really going to have to adapt in what sort of concrete ways after that, what, what, what the minister was talking about, if we don't have, if we go back to a, a full reopening, no more stop and start from the middle of June, how, how, how is the pub trade going to advance um, it, from June onwards? Ed and Emma in the first instance. Um. I think, uh, from my perspective, I think it, it, it will have to continue doing what it's always done, which is is uh, matching its offer to the needs of the community around it and, and the consumers it's, it's aiming at. Um, for me, pubs are, are are yes, they're they're community assets, but they're also businesses. They need to uh, they need to adapt their offer. Um, as the market evolves and changes, and, and you said, Jonathan, that that's been a uh, a never-ending sort of situation for pubs from sort of the, the early days of the first industry to, to what we have now. Um, the pace of change is perhaps a little bit quicker. Um, and I think the the emphasis from June moving forward is, is ensuring consumer safety, making people feel uh, comfortable and safe in the environments that are there. Um, and ensuring, as, I think the biggest challenge is going to be whilst doing that, also trying to maintain that 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 hospitality and 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 the fun social aspects that that is the cornerstone of, of a good pub experience um that i think is going to be the biggest challenge um, for operators going forward because whilst we hope restrictions are going to end uh in june uh, the general fear is that there's going to be a legacy is still of um some elements that will will linger. Um, uh, we have had talks of, of things like COVID passports and things like that, which which hopefully won't come to pass. But there is a fear that there there will be uh, a no complete full stop on restrictions. So for operators to manage that process um, while still ensuring that the experience of going to a pub is is what it should be, uh, is probably going to be the biggest challenge. Many thanks, Ed. If I could pose the same question to you, Emma. Hi, sorry. Yeah, no, it's it's difficult, isn't it, uh, to navigate your way through this. I mean, we want to see our pubs um, remain in our communities. And, and it's great that there is the community fund to help people if they want to buy their pub because they have no other way out, um, that they can try to save it. But of course, our priority has to be to try and save as many of those businesses that are in situ as we possibly can and make them viable businesses. And it's looking at how we can support them. You know, many of the pubs going into this, um, you know, how they survived the pandemic was based on the financial position they were going in. So we need to do everything that we can to support these pubs to make it viable for them to trade their way out as, as soon as we possibly can. That's what the removal of the restrictions will do. It will allow them to trade their way out of this. And that's what they want. But we have to have the right business environment for any pub to be able to trade and trade viably in our towns and, and importantly in our villages now um, and to keep supporting them where they can be in very many instances the only place where people can can get together these days so we, there is many things that we need to focus on but we need to make sure we're supporting businesses that are there to try and get them through this period of time many thanks um indeed emma now, let's go to into the q a box number of questions about the community ownership fund. Um, I'll just try and list them as, as quickly as possible to, to, to get responses. Um, the community, David Cooper asks, the community ownership fund sounds great, but it's becoming difficult to get pub, pubs listed as assets of community value. Will the government make this process easier? Um, Ian Chambers says, it's, a, a match fund is only a useful tool if the match from the community is substantial enough, um, will the CRF allow grant grant funding to be added to the community um, total? Um, any, anyone want to come in, Danny, Paul, about what the government might be doing to make, make that process any, any easier? 
Uh, uh, yeah, well, look, I, I, th I think we'll certainly make sure we want to make sure that the thing works, and uh, and we'll continue to uh, uh, to to see how much we can flex to to, to get it to, to to get it to work. But we can't save every pub, pub from Whitehall. Uh, it's really important that, the, the, you know, the, it is a community fund. We need to work with communities. Now, the best pe pe people to do this are at local authority level with community groups because they know their local economy. And we see the, the, the best local authorities are the ones that work in partnership with business as well. So that's not just a community fund. It's also licensing, planning, uh, the enforcement, obviously, of the, of, of the COVID rules, which I've, I've seen some quir quirky, shall I say, uh, rules over over the week uh, interpretations over the weekend so we have tried to make things as simple and as clear for local authorities to be able to follow but in terms of that community assets you do need that sort of rallying uh, point and um, local authorities are quite well placed for that. Thanks Minister. Danny would you like to come in? Just quickly yeah I, I, it's an interesting point I mean I've recognised the challenge around getting assets listed um, as assets for community value and that's an ongoing challenge um, broader than this discussion, but but how we do asset transfer most effectively, and I I very much support easing that that process. I'm not sure. I mean, I'm, I'm, I don't know whether you need to be listed as an asset of community value in order to qualify for the community ownership fund. I suspect not. I think it's broader than that, but but that's something I could check. Um, but I think the general point is is absolutely right that there is this problem. Um, uh, but echoing Paul's point that the that the impetus needs to be local. Um, what government can do and is doing is, is ensuring that places which might have less of the sort of institutional capital, the networks, the experience, the sort of professional base that wealthier areas have that often support these sort of uh, asset transfers and, and community mm -hmm. initiatives, um, those areas get the support financially to build up those uh, capabilities. And the Community Ownership Fund has an element of that, as do other schemes that are being presented at the uh, developed at the moment like the leveling up fund there's a recognition that places need capabilities uh not just financial wealth in order to um de develop a proper community-led foundational economy so i'd very much support what the government's doing on that and the more we can do and, and actually working with big you know in the pub business big brewers but also trust and foundations the sources of capital that can sustain a community-led hospitality industry need to be tapped into and I think there's a role for government in helping to uh, stimulate and induce that. Many thanks Dan. Well I've got you here. Um, Chris Couch from the Plunkett Foundation had puts a question about community rights which I know is something you've been looking at through levelling up our communities and this, the new social covenant. Um, what, what, how, he, what are your views about how effective community rights are or might be in helping communities protect assets, whether they're pubs or other social hubs? And what changes do you see as being necessary um, to help more communities um, empower themselves through such community rights? Well, thanks. And, and Plunkett Foundation are really important players in this space uh, and uh, real credit to them. Um, in fact, I think they're supporting the pub I mentioned in, uh, in Wiltshire. Um, so, uh, I mean, the answer is, you know, we're going back to the days of the big society when there was a really big idea that we could, government could effectively in, in support communities to take control of local institutions, whether public sector or private sector, um, and run them in the community interest. And that, uh, that, that period, I think, did achieve some real changes, um, but it didn't take off in the way I think we all would have wished. And I think there's an opportunity now to sort of do the big society properly this time. Um, which means being more ambitious about it, uh, more sustained, and, uh, and and putting some real power into communities, not just the, uh, the, the, the ability of places to challenge uh, public sector agencies to, um, to devolve more power and responsibility, but actually a, an obligation on the, the system to look at how it can empower communities. And I think we sh there should be a deliberate expectation that public agencies are looking through their, uh, their, their, their list of assets and think what here can, could, could be better managed by communities themselves rather than by us. Uh, so, and I think the community rights agenda is a big part of that. And I support the aspiration that many have for, a, for some legislation to strengthen uh, community rights and the power of places to take back control 
uh, of the institutions that they uh, that, that they use and and that perform those gathering places. So I think there is a there is a change going on in the, in the in the weather at the moment. And uh, you know that is, as I said earlier, the legacy of of COVID should be a real recognition of the incredible power that communities have to manage their local places. Um, and if we if, if if government can do something to enable that and to make it clearer what, what public sector agencies should be doing to support it, then I would I would be very much in favour of it. I think, Jonathan, if I may, there's, uh, uh, Danny talked about uh, the change in the weather. I think there's uh, there's a, another bit of change in the weather just beyond COVID and that the uh, sort of the rise of dis more discussion about social value, mm -hmm. social value across the economy. Now, pubs have been doing this for many years. We've talked about that. We talked about that in our opening remarks. So uh, pubs have never been a stranger to social value. But I think in, if you look at supply chains uh, around the wider economy, people are looking beyond the, 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 the bargain basement price. For, for things, look what 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 do those uh, businesses stand for? What, how do they how, uh, you know, how do they uh, represent that in their communities and their areas? So we do have an opportunity, I think, to, uh, to make move the public discourse onto uh, uh, onto this area. And so be, be be this is a really good top, topic to be having now. Many thanks indeed. Um, before we move on from community rights, Emma or Edge, would you like to come in and respond to any of that? I think uh, there is um, a lot that we can do to um, sustain uh, our communities and, and ensure that they have that sense of place. I think that's what really is underpinned in, in the power of the pub. Um, and that really is uh, in danger of being fragmented and frayed for a, a longer period of time. So we need to focus on how we can sustain that and the community rights will have a place in that I'm for sure but we need to look at how we can support our pubs that are in situ that are there and certainly looking at you know the ways that they've adapted and shown resilience throughout this crisis you know providing new services it would be great to see you know an extension of the business um, and uh, planning act to allow people to continue some of that diversification that they've done, to see some diversification grants put in place to help those businesses keep adapting um, and keep some of those additional services that they've done. You know, there are other things that we can do that maintain that reach out that we've done as, as a sector throughout this crisis that will hopefully enshrine us um, in those communities for the future. Many thanks, Nick. Yeah. Yeah, I'd, I'd just like to, I think there's there's some fantastic examples of, of community pubs. I think one of them's on this, the Bevy. Uh, I know I went to, to see that in its early stages and, and was blown away with some of the amazing things they were doing for their local community, um, uh, from repair shops to, to all sorts of things. Really great example of a community pub. Um, but I think it, we do need to remember that community ownership does also, I mean, those businesses still have to be viable. I said earlier that the pubs are businesses as well. They do need to remain viable. Um, and quite often there's a, there's a knee-jerk sort of community reaction to a, a perceived threat um, without any great forethought to, to what follows. And we quite often see the, these, these things go on to fail because they haven't thought through beyond the they, let's save the pub they need to have the process in place to ensure that they are viable survivable that people are taking them on that can run them and run them well so that's that's a key thing and, and when it comes to diversity as well um i don't think we've really mentioned pub is a hub yet but that's a great uh resource for operators to look to um to to find opportunities we've seen some brilliant schemes through them some grants some support that's helped uh, operators do everything from open up sort of community shops within their businesses through to library services and post offices as well. So that opportunity to diversify and, and provide more community services, much as the Bevy has done in, in Brighton, um, then look to people like Pub is a Hub and the Plunkett Foundation and groups like that, because they're a great resource to help with those. Many thanks indeed, Ed and panelists for covering off no community issues so well. Um, the, um, well-titled anonymous attendee um, has put in, you know, it is in terms of the, the, the economy, how we support pubs fiscally through um, other means. Now he, he raises a suggestion from Kevin Hollingrake MP about an ending business rates and replacing revenue with a small increase in VAT um, to fill the 30 billion um, of cost of abolishing business rates to level the playing field between online and high street. Now clearly, um, that, that's quite quite a kite to fly to, to fly here. But in, in terms, 
I'd like to gauge from the panel your views about you know, how we can use the tax system to better support um, our viable pubs to get through the hard yards from June onwards um, to any sort of thoughts and views as to what would be most helpful to the to our especially to our community pubs as well as those city and town centre pubs to get through this immediate um, period. Um, anyone feel free to unmute and come in. Um, I know you've got it first. Yeah, I will absolutely jump in on this one. We just want fairness. You know, there has to be a fairness in it. Pubs are paying you know, five times versus their turnover in terms of business rates. And it's completely untenable that we do so. So we need to have a real f overhaul of that system um, and review of what we can do. And of course, you know, when it comes to VAT, um, it is an issue for us, particularly versus supermarkets in terms of the VAT that they don't have to pay, but we do. So getting somewhere, um, you know, somewhere in the middle on that one, if we could see something in and around that 12.5% interim that we'll go to um, from June on as locked in for permanently, it would massively help a sector that is going to be, lead this recovery, um, employ young people, uh, create jobs, um, and give us some kind of level playing field that we can actually play on. And that, that is enormously important as we move forward in this and looking at those options and putting some real serious proposals together and on the table and looking at how we can review tax overall on them and reducing that, we have to do it. Many thanks, Emma. Oh, it would be remiss of me to forget beer duty as well, of course, which does definitely need to be reduced because our brewers are the heaviest tax sector in the United Kingdom. You, you knew Emma had a shopping list there, absolutely, absolutely right. And uh, she's a great advocate for, uh, for, for, for pubs and the use of the tax system. But uh, no, I think the, the, the interesting thing about the business rates regime overall, which is why we do the fundamental business rates, is that it, it is somewhat outdated. Um, so we'll see where we get to by October, but effectively businesses in general aren't really um, uh, judged uh, whether they're successful now and how much square footage they've got uh, in terms of bricks and mortar. So uh, so there's a lot of work to be done there. In terms of VAT, I mean, it's an interesting point from Kevin, so I probably won't uh, grab that uh, kite to be fl uh, flying just at the moment. But, uh, but in terms of the VAT, VAT and business rates are two quite predictable taxes for the Treasury. So in terms of looking at what you might do uh, with them, they're big ticket items for the Treasury and predictable. I think from memory, the uh, business rates relief that we've given uh, in, in retail and hospitality in particular, uh, something that equates to about 10 billion quid. VAT from memory, it's about 29 billion, something like that. So a lot of money involved. So if you're gonna get rid of that, you've got to find another way of bringing that money to the Treasury. Um, to, to, to ensure that our public uh, finances are in good order. But the, you talked about cities uh, and towns, and clearly they are lagging behind in terms of the recovery. We saw it at the end of the first lockdown, uh, and we're, we're, we're seeing it in this first week now as well. So there's the stuff we can do beyond the tax um, system, and that's to make sure that, first of all, we go with the grain of, of that return to work, um, and, and, but, but um, with the likely hybrid and blended working, however you want to phrase it, that's going to come from some of the bigger businesses. But really, we, we need to do a lot of comms, which we started to gather the data, starting to work with businesses. Um, as Minister for London, I'm doing a lot of work here, but also working with the metro mayors and local authorities across the country to make sure our towns can see that recovery and therefore our, so that they don't get hollowed out. The risk you have if the towns and cities are hollowed, hollowed out. I've likened London to being something like Gotham City, if you don't get it right, the central activity zone. If you, because you have the richest people coming in here who are, who are insulated from all of this, the poor people who are the lowest paid who have to travel into town to clean the offices to do all the, the low paid work, but it's the middle uh, who, who then go and uh, go somewhere else. And, and they are the people that we need to return. But clearly we also need to um, encourage back international uh, students, international travel, as well as those workers uh, as well, which will take time. But uh, but but we but we're working on ways of of encouraging that uh, that return to work. But also to Emma's point about the uh, about what more we can do at a local authority um, level to make sure some of the measures that are put in place for outdoor dining, outdoor drinking, and these kind of things can be made semi permanent. I saw at the um, last autumn when I went to stay in um, Cyrus, not far from Danny, 
uh, I um, I saw a chap taking a cup a cup of coffee from the cafe and sitting down at a table that'd been put in the middle of a mini roundabout with a few cones around it. I can't think, you know, that was quite extraordinary. But if you could just do it something slightly different, put a, some nice of um, uh, semi permanent walls around, it makes it far far more convivial than rather than uh, sitting the poor chap sitting there in the rain. But uh, that but these are all moves that we can do with local authority support as well. Many thanks indeed, Minister. Daniel, Ed, anything you'd like to come into in, term, in terms of either central government fiscal support or more creative local forms of support for our pubs? I think Anna's, Anna's raised good points. I think the, the tax regime needs reform. Business rates is a, uh, it's a huge problem uh, for operators. It's been one that we've been long talking about that, that needs uh, needs addressing. Uh, VAT, it'd be lovely to have parity uh, on VAT uh, with, the, with the retail sector. Um, that has been a, a holy grail for, for some time. It would be fantastic for wet-led pubs to see um, that VAT cut that we've currently got applied across to the alcohol side as well that would be a big boost to those operators um, so those, those are the key things uh, I think uh, that we're certainly sort of uh, talking about and, and speak to operators about. Many thanks um, Ed. Danny. No, 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 nothing much for me and I won't, I won't just wade in on the tax questions although obviously easy for me to say uh, uh, not as a minister that I'd support all tax cuts for this uh, for the sector. Uh, um, I, uh, I, I mean, I think the, the, the point's been made, but the opportunity for more flexible planning uh, would be helpful. You know, we need to, our high streets to be as flexible as they can to, to have all sorts of innovations. And, uh, you know, we've, we've discovered that actually people, you know, we are kind of continental in the way we want to live and have uh, experienced the high street. And, um, uh, and I, so I, I would support further moves on, on planning and flexible uses. For, uh, for for high street venues, um, and then I think there's a there's an important piece around the support that should be given for small brewers uh, to, um, to 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 benefit from uh, from from the the tax regime. And I, I'm conscious that there's a campaign going on to support around that. So um, you know, we, the shift that's happening is to a more local, more sustainable economy, and there's a way to ensure that that happens for our, our breweries and our pubs too. And I, I, I think the government sees this as a, uh, a sort of natural area for it, and um, you know I hope we we'll get uh, I hope we we'll get more of that. And as I say, I think this what's going on in football is parallel as well. We need to get away from this idea that the only efficient players are the largest, and we need to have a more place based uh, vision of how we uh, of, of how we do this 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 business of kind of commercial and community work together. Can I say, uh, Jonathan, because we've talked a lot about community pubs as, it, as almost in isolation as a hub, but, the, but they clearly have a massive role to play in the future of the high street as well. You know, I remember when I was a local councillor in Sutton 15 years ago talking about what the high street's going to look like in 10, 15 years' time. Now we're talking, it's just accelerated the conversation. We're now talking about what does it look like in a year's time. And clearly re retail's had a structural issue uh, with the advent on our online anyway uh, and so we do need to keep tackling that but therefore what is the you know how is the high street going to look like and there's a uh, the destination can easily you can easily see the role of hospitality within that as a, a place to go for fun to enjoy yourself and and shop at the same time so they, this, this is it's all this sort of thinking we do need to do quite frankly in a hurry now to make sure that we don't lose our high streets but the hospitality can be the solution there Many thanks indeed, Paul. Well, we're coming to the, the end of our allocated time. So I'm going to pretty much um, draw things to, um, to an end, more or less. Now, what I will do is I'll ask each of our panellists in turn to briefly in 20 seconds or less to give us either their likely probable future for the beer and hospitality industry or, failing that, a golden vision for how we can build back better for our, our pubs, starting with Ed, if that's OK. It's a disadvantage of being uh, alphabetical on this one, isn't it? No time to think. Uh, I mean, I, I think we, we'd like to see, I would like to see actually the, uh, the impact on, um, uh, of the pandemic 
as repositioning the pub with its place in society, with its place within government, the view and vision of it, that hopefully it will open eyes to, to the importance of the sector, what it means for the economy, what it means for the communities. Uh, Paul touched on the regeneration. I think that is going to be key. We're going to have some huge gaps in there in the centres, town centres and high streets that are going to need filling and pubs will be a key and hospitality generally will be a key part of that regeneration prospect. So me, for me, the future is um, hopefully better recognition, more uh, fairness of treatment in terms of taxation and, um, and government support and, and recognition of, of that important role that they play. Many thanks. Um, Ed, Danny, quickly, how do you see the future panning out? Well, I'd, I'd say that leaving health and social care aside, the, the really desperate story of, of this of the last year has been around Firstly, education, and secondly, hospitality. Those are those are the sort of areas of life where I think we've seen the most difficulties. And the government has rightly made education and young people its primary focus for the recovery. That's what the prime minister is saying. He's really determined to put things right for young people. I think on the economic side, really putting things right for hospitality and for the local pub in particular. And obviously, I've got a particular interest in rural pubs, which is so vital. But I, I just think the political stress on this is, is what's needed. And I think we have that. I think the government is completely supportive. But the more we can build a narrative around the role of pubs in the recovery and in the future local sustainable society that we want, the better. Many thanks indeed, Danny. Emma, please, over to you. Well, I think we've shown as amazing resilience as a sector throughout the pandemic, um, but some of our businesses are really hanging on by their fingertips. So we desperately need the restrictions to fall away uh, on June the 21st and get open inside and out as soon as possible so that we can trade our way out and, and into a big recovery. You know, we've invested, you know, 500 million to make our venues COVID secure, more on making our outdoor areas even more hospitable and, and publicos and brewers supporting their businesses throughout this crisis as best they can we've invested to for the future of the great british pub and we need the government now to do the same to ensure that we'll be there to deliver on things like delivering uh, leveling up the social infrastructure that we deliver job creation employment for young people you know we can do all of that but just believe in us invest in us and, and give us the space to, to run our businesses as we see fit thank you many thanks emma and final word to the minister please Thank you. Thank you very much and thanks for a really good conversation and uh, look, we've put £352 billion pounds into the economy to, to, uh, as a result of the pandemic uh, but what pub publicans, uh, as Emma said, and pub owners really want is to be able to trade. They are social people, it's a social business, they want to connect people, uh, which as Danny said, unfortunately, is the uh, exact definition of how you catch the virus in the first place. Not that you, but not that you stigmatise it within the pubs, but it's just connections in general. Now we are starting to get to that point when we getting to a, uh, uh, a safer point that we can actually just start come back together. So it's really important that we do use our pubs. But yes, we need to, to, to work with uh, our local community groups, our local authorities. We need to be uh, 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 building on our community renewal fund, which allows people to bid into for, uh, the pilot programs for, uh, for, for local skills as well to make sure that pubs aren't just there is no one form of pub you know we talked about the, not just the pub is the hub but also the 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 city and town center uh pubs and bars as well they all, all work as an ecosystem so whether it's tourism retail hospitality everything is connected within this and that's why it's so important that we must um uh, recognize the different types of pubs what they bring to our villages our towns and our cities in community wise but also economically as well that important part of the economy that they represent minister thank you very much thank you to all our great panelists today ed beddington danny kruger emma mcclarkin minister paul scully that's the wrap now thank you so much for your time and consideration we'll send um, a copy of this to all who've registered for you to say and a copy of the power of pubs but from me and for all the colleagues at the car list thank you so much for your time your questions and participation today we'll say goodbye for now thank you very much indeed thank you <laughs>